This program is made possible in part by the generous support of Gordon G. Lund. Hello and welcome. As part of my ongoing series with Minnesota leaders, I'm going to be talking tonight with an amazing leader, John Cunningham, who, as many of you know, is a nationally known, internationally known architect that we're lucky to have living right here in Minnesota. There are a few things I want to just share with you before I let John talk. <laughs> and um, I wanted to mention that in 2018, Cunningham, the group that he founded, uh, celebrated 50 years. So that's uh, a milestone that, that impresses everybody. Um, he started the company uh, just with a few people in 1968, just a few years after he graduated from grad school. So that struck me too as unusual. He's had some fabulous recognition and awards. Um, he was awarded the state's highest individual architect uh, honor, which is called the AIA Minnesota Gold Medal. And one really fun um, award, or I, I was so intrigued, uh, you designed a building that got the award from the Associated Contractors as best building built in the United States uh, in 2014. So that was a, a fun, fun thing to learn. So welcome, John. Well, thank you. It's very nice to be here. Glad to have you here, finally. Um, what is this building before, we, before people forget that I just said that? What? Uh, if you ask me what award I was proud of this stuff, I'd have to say that one because, oh. first of all, it was the contractors. And contractors might view a building with a different eye than architects. And mm -hmm. they look at challenges, they look at uh, difficulty, they look at ingenuity of solutions that they use to solve problems presented by the design. And in 2014, they chose that building as the best building in the United States, built, and which is a sort of a heady idea, yeah, so I've always particularly cherished that one. It and was where a, is it, John? It's in uh, Verona, Wisconsin, which is a suburb of Madison, about 20 miles outside, and it's part of the headquarters of the Epic Systems Corporation, which is, makes medical software. Right, I think a lot of us who go to the doctor know about Epic. Yep. <laughs> it's, it's the biggest software, medical software company. And you've designed a lot of their buildings on their all of big their campus, all of their buildings. All of their buildings. And I believe you said they had 14,000 employees. Yeah, 14,000 employees. So a employees. lot of buildings. <laughs> and, and I started working for them in 1996. They had 100 employees and mm. I had 100 employees. Mm. And the CEO and I used to trade management books but apparently she had a b bigger vision than I did because but she grew to 14,000. your firm has now, I believe I read correctly, 850? 350. 350, 350 employees. Yes. And you told me the average number uh, working for an architectural firm was only six. Correct. So that's a big jump off average here. Uh, yeah. and and. If you'd asked me in my wildest dreams how big did I think we'd get in the 80s or 90s, I would have said 90 would be just a wonderful sign. Mm. So uh, it's, it's really been quite amazing to watch it grow. And part of the reason for that is the way we 
kept diversifying the practice and that we went to Asia at a fairly early time in the, uh, in the early 90s. Was that with Disney? Uh, partly with Disney and uh, partly we got, uh, we got uh, people in Korea heard about us and um, they asked us to do buildings in Korea. Mm. We had, at one point we had an office in Seoul, Korea. Mm. So many stories I want to pursue. I want to tell the viewers that we're going to intersperse photos of many of John's projects throughout the interview, and we'll try to ID them post-production, so um, you'll, you'll be impressed and intrigued, I think, as, as they roll through. I have to ask you a go back a bit question here, John. When did you first say to yourself, I really think I want to pursue becoming an architect. That's sort of an odd story. I taught at the university for 17 years. and At the School of Architecture. At the School of Architecture. Yeah. I taught design. And I used to often tell the students, up to the time I was 19 years old, I had never met or spoken to an architect. Oh. So if you asked me if I wanted to be an architect, I didn't display any interest whatsoever. Yeah, you wouldn't not knowing anyone. And and I went into the, I attended the University of Minnesota for aeronautical engineering huh. because I liked to draw, and in my youthful innocence, I thought aeronautical engineers drew cool planes, and so mm -hmm. I thought, wow, this is natural for me. Well, aeronautical engineers study airfoils and lift, and drag, and viscosity, and wind tunnels, and I decided that was just a little more scientific than I wanted to be. And pretty narrow in yeah. terms of... So at age 19, I switched into drawing for pre-architects. Mm. And that was the first architect I'd met, huh. who taught the course at the university. And I... Was that and Ralph the rest is Rapson? history. I mean... No, it wasn't Rapson. It okay. was, uh, in fact, I can't remember his name. A very nice gentleman. He was a draftsman in the local architect's office, and he just taught this course called Drawing for Pre-Architects. And uh -huh. I went in there with a bunch of other people who were going to go into architecture school, and they, some of their fathers were architects. They'd always wanted mm -hmm. to be an architect. I was really a foul ball in that group, uh -huh. and I was just walking in and it turned out to be something that was very exciting and interesting to me. And but you, how I got there, it was, it was it's a kind of serendipitous. Circuitous. Yes. <laughs> um, I talked to an architect friend earlier today, and um, I, I asked him why he got into architecture, and I wanted to just see, you know, a range of ideas. He said, "Well, I think architects are the most interesting people. They're quirky. Sometimes they're egocentric." But above all, they're creative people. And I thought, double check that with you, but I bet, I bet he was pretty right on. Well, I'm asked by parents often, is architecture a good field? And how do I know my child's good for architecture? And I say, well, creativity is something. And they like to make things. Mm. They like to make things. And as I look back in my history, they, there were the seeds. I, whether it was making mm -hmm. a model or mm -hmm. making a fort or whatever it was when I grew up, I, was, I made things. Uh, I didn't tinker with machines or things like that. I, was, I would build things, tree houses, and mm -hmm. make things That's like that. That's a good uh, flag for parents who are listening yeah. and thinking, uh -huh. I wonder if my child would be a fit here. What do you think are the, the most critical um, skills that to be successful as an architect um, you really should have or hone if you don't? Hmm. Um, they're, they're, they're mathematical skills. You have to, you have to like geometry. Mm. Um, and uh, I always like numbers. 
and I discovered that was a good thing, whether they were dimensions or dollars. And of course, dollars are a big deal in architecture. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, I liked numbers and I was interested in manipulating them. And, uh, but it's, it's very tactile. Mm -hmm. It's very hands-on and... Um, uh, but it's also a people um, field. I mean, you've got to work with the people who are wanting the house or the, the that, that's, building. That's really a good point. I used to tell people, I said, working for a client was a relationship. Mm -hmm. And a, a house client is a year or two. A big client, right. I've known the CEO of, of uh, Epic for 27 years. Wow. And yeah. I know, she and I know a lot about each other. Yeah. And we talk socially and all sorts of things like that. But I, I like her, but I enjoy working with her too. So there's that yeah. combination. Yeah. And I, I, uh, I think I like, I like working for people. Somebody asked me one time, what do you think you're trying to do for people? I said, I think I'm trying to make them successful in whatever they're doing in the building. Whether it's living in a house or making a product or how do I help them, how do I facilitate that success? You know, um, something I read before tonight said that you really see architecture as a career that serves the society, that serves the community. Um, and in that, of course, people's skills are crucial. But tell me more about that, because that was something I hadn't considered when I thought about architecture and yeah. you. For me, architects are in service to society. Society needs architects the way they need lawyers to administer the law or doctors for medicine. And there is a higher calling than fees and the dollars. It is how does, how, how am I in service to society? Whether it's designing, one of my favorite subjects was urban design. Hmm. Somebody said to me, what is, what's urban design? I said, urban design is creating value. They said, how do you do that? And I said, well, I'll give you a very simple one. In 1900, they invented Lake of the Isles in Minneapolis. It was a swamp. And they cleaned it up a little bit and made a bridle path around it. And then in their wisdom, they made a parkway around it and put the houses on the other side of the parkway. Guess where the most valuable houses right. in Minneapolis now it are? Is. Right. In Lake of the Isles. Now then they didn't quit there, they did it with all the lakes. They did it with every body of water in Minneapolis. So that was what we would call landscape architecture? But it was urban design. Okay. The parkways are the emerald necklace. They go all along the river and they're our pride and joy. We're often picked as the best park system in the United States. I know it. Yeah. Number one or two, I think, yeah. every year and, almost. And show me the parkways, I'll show you value. Mm -hmm. So I said, that's a simple way to think about it. And you can talk about that in different kinds of things. It, it, a quintessential example of urban design, for example, is Paris. Mm. The squares the and the circles, and the Arc de Triomphe, mm -hmm. the Place de la Concorde. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're just, uh, they're why we visit. Where, where do you go see the Tuileries, the Louvre, you know? You, uh, it's just a, uh, uh, that's another form of value. Oh, that, yeah, that all makes sense. Um, Minnehaha Academy is um, the, the new high school that your firm um, worked and developed so quickly in 20 months. is right on the Mississippi River. And I've been there because I have a, a grandson going there. And the design, as you talk about the lakes, really maximizes the views of the river road and the river, doesn't it? Yeah, the, the, uh, we've had the opportunity to work at a couple of the schools and, and Minnehaha is a site you almost perf 
approach with reverence. Mm -hmm. It's on the gorge. The Mississippi is one of the most beautiful gorges in the Mississippi. And it has those beautiful trees, these mature oaks. And to approach the design of that campus was to enhance. <laughs> Somebody asked me one, what was the greatest value an architect brought an owner? And I said, the site design. Mm -hmm. The site design. To get the right. That was surprising to them. Well, it isn't that the structure. I said, no, it's taking advantage of the site and the way the daylight comes in and the natural attributes and assets of the site. Mm -hmm. I think if you ask me what that building does, it does that the best. You're Uses in light. the trees, you're in the gorge, you're, you're, it's just, it celebrates that site. Well, that's a good example then, isn't it, of what you're talking about with urban design. Exactly. You and I were talking a little bit before we started taping about your idol and um, Tell us who you've picked as number one idol in your field. Well, there's probably more than one, but you, we were speaking specifically. Uh, when I was young and in school, I was in uh, Aero Sarnen was my idol. And I think he was constantly inventive. He, he tried to personify or the, uh, eg exemplify the company in his designs. Uh, several great buildings that he did. The Arch in yes. St. Louis. I often tell the people Arch. <laughs> the most graceful memorial ever. You know, yeah. I mean. I hadn't realized he designed yeah, that. He uh, the yeah, he designed the Arch and, uh, and he won that in a competition. He often won competitions. And it's, uh, that's, that's one of my favorite buildings. My other favorite building that he did was the uh, John Deere headquarters mm -hmm. in Moline, Illinois. Mm -hmm. It's a gorgeous building, all made out of Corten steel, which naturally rusts, which gives it this beautiful mm -hmm. brown purple color. Mm -hmm. And it, it's 60 years old, and it looks like it was built yesterday. Wow. When you mentioned that, I, I want to have you also speak about how you are identified as a modernist. And that is, as I was reading and thinking about that term, using natural structures as part of the design, bringing the outdoors in, um, letting the structural part of a building shine. Um, tell us more about why you are a modernist. When I was in school, there was a lot of ideology. And one of the major parts of the ideology was the Bauhaus. Mm -hmm. And the Bauhaus was a wonderful revolution of architects and designers in the early 1920s in Germany. And it was as much of a political statement in providing design for the masses. Mm -hmm. And the way to do that was to make it economical. <laughs> Some of them overdid it in making it look industrial, almost too industrial. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, America was doing wonderful stuff called modern. And an example of that was the Chrysler Building, mm -hmm. the Empire State Building. The trio. That I often tell people, just go to the lobbies and you'll understand what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. They're very modern. They're done with modern materials and they are gorgeous. Mm -hmm. But they were evil. And there was a morality to the Bauhaus that ornament was evil. Mm -hmm. And they even quoted that. And I always sort of liked ornament. Mm -hmm. But I did it, I was a closet liker of ornament, uh -huh. you know. And Frank Lloyd Wright was one of my personal idols, but I could never admit that because he, God forbid, used ornament like crazy. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the reason why people like him so much, because he was so fanciful. But I always admired him, but I couldn't really say that out loud when I was in school. <laughs> but you're telling us now. Yeah, I'm, your tell, secret. I'm confessing. <laughs> so modernism, straight lines, no ornaments, um, right angles, not right angles? It, it's the most economical. The, the part of modernism was doing things 
as directly and economically as possible. I just moved out of a house built yeah. in 1891 by my great grandfather. And the house is this gorgeous old Victorian, ornamental, high Victorian, uh -huh. Queen Anne Victorian. And here was this modernist living in this yeah. high Victorian house. Now, I was living there because my great grandpa built it. Not and so the value. blood was thicker than water, and <laughs> right. uh, my wife and I bought it, and we restored it, and then we fell in love with it, and we moved in, lived there for eight years. And it was a big house, five bedrooms and mm -hmm. lots of space. And, uh, and I loved the craftsmanship and the workmanship and the incredible uh, labor that went into that house. Mm -hmm. And when I went to insure it, I was so worried because a house that big would, you could insure for X dollars. I had to insure it for almost two X because to reproduce that house oh, would have sure. been just incredibly yeah, expensive. Yeah, if it had burned or. So. so now you're back living in a more Now I'm living in modern. a modernist place, okay. floor to ceiling glass. I'm very comfortable in that too. And I'm interested, my wife and I have been talking about what we enjoy. In our Victorian house, you enjoyed just sitting there. The woodwork was so beautiful. Looking around. Different uh -huh. wood in each one. The craftsmanship, stained glass everywhere. Mm -hmm. and, and there was constantly something to delight the eye. Mm -hmm. In our new house, the simplicity is, is dominant, but we live outside. We have floor-to-ceiling glass, wall-to-wall mm -hmm. so -wall glass, that brings in and we outside. live on a corner of the building. Ah. So we leave really, it's literally we know each second the sun changes and mm -hmm. the clouds change and the sun comes out and so starts to rain. So very different It's very, reward. we can't get over what we took as normal in the Victorian house and how now we're living outside comparatively. Yeah. You know? Are we, you high up too now? No, we're not, no, we're not that high. We're on the second floor, oh, okay. but we, we like it there because it's so convenient, you know? And oh. we can see the people in the park with a right across the street. <laughs> now, we're a little bit favorable. We have a park right across the street and oh, that is nice. full of green grass and leaves. We've only got five minutes left, Jen just got a time cube. Um, can you look ahead and, th and share a bit of what you see coming down the road in terms of trends and architecture? One, I know we're going to have to be more sustainable, um, creative in that way. What are some others? Uh, uh, let's go back. We're in service to society. Uh, affordable housing. If you're John Cunningham. Yeah. And <laughs> Well, I, architecture, I feel pretty strongly and I would, that would be an announcement for me. Okay. But um, starting in the 70s with Jimmy Carter, we started doing sustainability. Mm. We did solar houses, earth sheltered mm. houses. So we did all sorts of things. And that's just going to become more so. You're going to be, they're, they're already talking about heat islands in downtown cities and by greening the roofs, you can cool the cities. And there are all different methods you can use. And we're going to make, we're going to do more with less, and we're going to use more uh, generated energy as opposed to fossil fuel generated energy. Do but you think um, private homes will Get Absolutely. smaller. The, the cheapest way to generate energy is solar and wind. That is cheaper right. than oil, that is cheaper than gas. That's, and, and once we learn how to store it, then that's what we'll change to. Um, and and size-wise, do you think, is there going to be a trend there, smaller? Uh, Epic has 14,000 employees on a sunny, breezy day they take no electricity from the grid at all. Mm -hmm. We have enough solar collectors and wind generators that we generate all their electricity. So we can do that in private we homes. Can, we can all no we problem. can do that for anything. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh huh. 
and it's to, we're on the very early stages of that and it's being stifled by the fossil fuel industries and they want make you think it's harder than it is it's not well that's good to know yeah. that's good to know um, when you think about your legacy one of the things I kept reading as I read about you was that you were way out ahead in terms of um, encouraging diverse kinds of people to become architects, um, women, kids of minority status, um, younger, younger people, not just uh, accomplished older grad students. Um, what else do you see as part of your legacy? Um, one of the things I'm proudest of is that whole idea of listening. Mm. I told you about the Ford Foundation asking us, how do we design inner city schools? And we came up with this idea, well, well first we start listening. To what so they we went want, in, so. we did a school in, in inner city Minneapolis with the largest indigenous people population. 25% of the students were indigenous. American hmm. and um, we went into the classrooms we asked the students I asked the students if they were proud of their school and they told me yes we're proud of our school but you aren't but you aren't yes and I said who's the you and they said the educational uh, uh. Minneapolis Board of Education mm -hmm. and I said oh really why and they said the average school gets painted every eight years, we get painted every 25 years. Oh, wow. And that was a fact. That was 1972. And so that listening, we started to talk, we were flown all over the United States to talk to different school districts to talk about that. That's the answer I wouldn't have thought you would have shared, but I love it, you know, I mean, such a basic part of communication and that's critical to getting the product you want when you're working with people, right? Well, thank you, John, so much. This it's been has a pleasure. been thank fascinating you. to get to pick your brain and I know we've moved fast here from subject to subject, but I'm sure the audience has learned a lot and, and uh, appreciated Thanks what they've learned asking. about you. I enjoyed it. So, wonderful to have you here. Thank you for being with us. I'll be back again next week. Until then, have a good week. Mm -hmm.